Today, we have some really awesome presenters. Um, we have Chris Nagy. He is of the Gotham Coyote Project and Mianus River Gorge. He is going to talk to us about his latest research in studying um, coyotes and their migrations to Long Island. We have Mike Bottini, Sea Tuck's wildlife biologist and the co-coordinator of the Long Island Coyote Study Group. And he's going to talk to us about the work that the group is doing to research these, uh, this coyote migration. And then we have Jimena Perez Viscasillas of the Long Island Sound Study. She is the outreach coordinator, coordinator who is going to help me moderate today's webinar. Um, she's going to be looking closely at the Q&A section. Um, and I think that is about it. And also, I almost forgot myself, Ariel Santos. I am also of SeaTuck, and I will be going over the Coyote Tracker Survey. So without further ado, Chris, whenever you are ready, you can take it away. All right, let me share this thing. All right, I hope you can see it. Uh, yep, looks good. Okay, good. Oops. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, we'll see if you regret it. Um, I, as Ariel said, I work for a place called the Mianus River Gorge, uh, which is actually located up in Westchester, uh, Northeast Westchester near, near Bedford. Um, but we've studied coyotes uh, now for going on 10 years and with some other smaller projects, even around 15 uh, in the Westchester and, and, and more so in the New York City area. So uh, I was asked today to just talk about our research and how that might apply or be useful to kind of predicting what might happen in Long Island. And then to introduce um, the Coyote Tracker, if you're not already familiar with it, I foresee there'll be a lot of potential going forward for you know, citizen science and, and community observations to be um, put into this, you know, very big effort to like just keep track and see how coyotes uh, integrate into New York and Long Island uh, area. So I'll get started. Uh, at the end, also, my last note, I'll, I'll talk a bit about, you know, how we can coexist with coyotes if some of you have concerns. Um, you know, I've worked in Westchester now for nearly 20 years. And so the coyotes there have been, uh, have been there a long time. And so I have a little experience with people's questions and, and things they might do to um, coexist. So I'm sure most of you are aware, but uh, just in case you aren't, or you've never seen one, or, or you know, you've, you've uh, you know, just to, to check on the general life history of the species, coyotes are um, basically a small wolf very small compared to uh, gray wolves. Uh, they're somewhere around 20 to 40 pounds. And the ones in the, in the East are a little bit bigger, or can be a little bit bigger, but they still average around 30 pounds. And um, historically they were located, uh, you know, they evolved basically in the, in the West, Midwest, you know, sort of between the Mississippi and the Rockies. And there's some debates about this, but generally this little red blob is, is agreed upon by most folks. Uh, about like where were coyotes, you know, 5,000 years ago. Um, so in the last 150 years or so, they've spread all through the continent. I'll show you another map in a moment. Um, but interestingly, and I won't go into this in depth, but people always have questions. Uh, yes, indeed, the coyotes that we see uh, on the East Coast and even in, in elsewhere uh, often are sort of a mix of many different species of the Canis uh, genus. So most of them, um, or at least most coyotes are mostly uh, coyotes, uh, but they do have some ancestry with wolves and dogs. And, and that's not to say that a coyote you might see in Long Island or, or upstate New York, you know, its parents were not a wolf and a dog and a coyote. It, its parents were two of these kind of hybrids. Um, and the wolf stuff happened many generations ago um, and, and pretty far north of here. So um, I can answer more questions later, but I won't go into that too much, but everyone's very interested in that topic. So to, um, 
zoom out a little more, or at least uh, zoom in to the larger map, the larger continent, the reason we sort of see this kind of north-south uh, progression within New York State over time. So, you know, coyotes showed up in New York in the 40s, uh, and it was way up in the Adirondacks, and now most recently they're coming to Long Island. The reason that is is because the first kind of wave or first, you know, path that coyotes took from the west to the east was over the Great Lakes uh, and then down the east coast. And that also uh, informs us as to where those wolf backgrounds uh, started, where did it come from, it came from uh, coyotes interbreeding with one of the last or the last kind of group of eastern wolves up in Ontario. Um, Algonquin Provincial Park is sort of the center of this population of eastern wolves. And the wolves didn't have many options, so they interbred with coyotes. And so that's, again, why we get that uh, uh, mixture of, of different backgrounds. <clears throat> When we started our research, um, we didn't know if there were coyotes in New York City at all. I mean, sightings had happened, but generally if we say, do, does a species live in this area? What we really mean in most cases as, as ecologists, you know, is it breeding? <laughs> is it persisting in this area? Is there habitat that will support uh, the animal or, or whatever species uh, to breed or reproduce here and then, you know, have those offspring recruit for the next generation? So we were certain everyone sort of knew, everyone in the biz anyway, knew that coyotes were well distributed, nearly ubiquitous on the mainland, you know, Westchester County here where I live, uh, Connecticut, New Jersey, all through uh, the mainland. Uh, we weren't sure, like I said, about the city, but then we were, everyone was fairly certain there were no breeding populations of coyotes anywhere on Long Island. Uh, and again, this, there may of course be a wanderer, they're very mobile, uh, animals so they can walk hundreds of miles in their lifetime but uh, in terms of, again breeding there were no populations of on long island and you'll see that this map is now outdated great way to look for species in any given place where you don't have to be there every day actually looking for them is to hang these uh things we call trail cameras or camera traps they're digital cameras they have an infrared sensor they can detect movement so anything about a squirrel or larger that walks in front, it, you know, you strap it to a tree, an animal walks in front and it takes some pictures. And so you end up with uh, these sorts of images, this, this, uh, this type of data where um, now with the modern cameras, they can, they can take pictures very rapidly. So you can take pictures, uh, you know, every second or so. Um, in the old days when we had film cameras, you know, you had 30 pictures. <laughs> and so you didn't want it to take pictures as rapidly, but now with digital cameras and big memory cards, we can get sort of this uh, slideshow of different things. And so you can even see behaviors and such like that. This is a coyote den, obviously. Um, somewhere in, in May, the pups first come out of the den, but they're still highly tied to the den. And only in July do we start seeing slightly larger pups wandering around in the woods. And we also get data on, um, all the different species of animals, like I said, squirrel and up of anything that walks on the ground. Um, and so we can look at how coyotes might be changing the community, the wildlife community uh, in these places where they arrive and establish themselves. So you'll see over time that coyotes have, have rather rapidly spread into different parks throughout the, the city. Um, so if you're not geographically inclined. This would be Westchester where I said we have coyotes and they are breeding. So blue means breeding. And um, then this is sort of the Bronx, Manhattan's here and then the top of Queens is right here. So um, we found them in a few places in 2011. Um, didn't get evidence of breeding, but, but that was more a, a symptom of, of when we put the cameras out. And then as we kept looking, we saw them arrive at new places. Uh, we did get evidence, pictures of pups, just like the one I showed you, uh, are, are, are our evidence of breeding. And then that just continued to spread. And then if we go down to Queens, um, you know, Queens is a much bigger place. There's probably more, a little bit more suburban development in between the parks. Um, you know, it's, it's unclear what pl obvious places they'll show up. I mean, we have guesses, but sightings have, have helped us a lot in this large area of figuring out at least where we hope most of the coyotes are. Uh, and so that goes into what 
you know, the purpose of today. But we did receive several sightings uh, up through 2015 that kind of tipped us off to where coyotes might be. Uh, more sightings, and then we actually did get breeding, uh, uh, the first breeding family in uh, on geographic Long Island and, um, and so on. And then as of 2020, um, we still have some coyotes in Queens. Um, no breeding going on right now. This one is probably gone. So these are kind of large, by and large, lone coyotes. Uh, this is a recent arrival. We'll see how he does. And then we, we are starting to get more observations and more confirmed photographs and such uh, through the, the Long Island Study Group. Um, out in Nassau. And um, so, you know, one of the things we do, this research is supposed to help, you know, people who live in the area, the, the agencies and government, you know, what, what, what should we do about these animals? If anything, what are they, what are the animals doing? Are they eating pets? <laughs> are they uh, affecting the the park, you know, food web and that sort of thing. So we try to advise the city and, and in the beginning it was kind of tricky. You know, a lot of agencies were like, oh my God, coyotes in New York City, that's a headache we don't even want to think about. But uh, over time, I've been very impressed with the way the city has kind of, uh, led by the parks department, uh, has kind of embraced urban wildlife. And this is a subway slash bus uh, ad campaign and they've replaced the coyote in all different posters with deer or falcons or raccoons and stuff but obviously coyote is the my favorite so you know just saying that you know these animals it's not an aberration to have animals in a city environment you know people are the ones that sort of put these arbitrary boundaries like city is not natural I mean the city is odd uh, it's an unusual and rather new habitat but you know an animal is just going to give it a shot and look for food and try to raise its young. And, and if it works, it'll, it, you know, there's no distinction necessarily. And so that's sort of the, what I would argue that human, the way humans should look at it. And Elvin often, uh, you know, even see it as a positive, right? I think this is really cool that this animal, despite our best efforts, has flourished in all sorts of places. And even, uh, you know, the urban angle is not even the full story. Coyotes have moved from that you know, original red blob that I showed you, they've gone all the way up into Alaska and now they're being photographed and observed south of the, over the Panama Canal moving into South America. So, you know, this is a very adaptable, very resilient, very clever, <laughs> if you want to use that word, uh, species that, um, you know, did all of this uh, without our help. So where can we expect coyotes to show up? Well, you know, Long Island is is its own unique place, but it also resembles in many ways places where coyotes have flourished. Uh, Westchester County, for example, um, you know, the suburban to urban and, and even into rural uh, as you go north kind of mimics the gradient of landscape use uh, from west to east that you see in Long Island. So when, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll mention it again, I, I, I often look at these when i when i am looking at a site that say either has or hasn't coyote you know if, if they're absent that's pretty clear but if if there's several well three levels of sort of coyote presence at a site right so you could have certainly just one going through and we were lucky enough to get a picture of it or someone sent us a, a, a picture or a sighting and and then you never see it again and so that's you know, a, a coyote moving through, trying to find a better place. Uh, it's disper It's a young one dispersing, trying to find a territory of its own or something like that. It could be, it could leave, it could go somewhere else. It could be hit by a car and it's dead, you know. So these are very transitory observations. That's kind of the first one. And we don't, we, we certainly collect those, but they're not very meaningful ecologically yet. And then the next phase is maybe a lone coyote that lives in a place for several years, but the, the site is not suitable. Um, it just doesn't have enough food for it to breed. It, it never meets a mate, right? These, these are green spaces that are often, you know, islands in a large matrix of concrete uh, and pavement. So, you know, the fact that one gets to a spot, now you also need another one of the opposite sex to get to that spot for even having a chance of breeding. And, and so, you know, you have some places where coyotes 
even live and we get pictures regularly, but they haven't bred. And so if we look at those sites, the, the sort of requirements uh, in very coarse terms in terms of area and um, just the number of people, we've got you know, a coyote that lived for 10 years in a spot that's only you know, 20 something acres. And we've got coyote in Central Park that's been there for two or three years now. And that place is crazy busy. There, there's people, 100,000 100, people visit Central Park a day. So those are very broad, like those, those minimums are very uh, you know, easy to, to meet. Nearly anything in any green space in Long Island would be suitable uh, if those are the requirements. You know, if this is what a, a coyote could tolerate on its own, then you could say nearly all of Long Island is suitable. Um, so more restrictive and probably more meaningful ecologically is what are re what's required for breeding and what's required for a, a family group to live there for a long time and have multiple generations and, and really, you know, establish itself. And that we find is a little more restrictive. So, you know, nearly 200 acres, and that's like the total territory size, um, you know, of, of green space within a, 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 a whole territory. And, and so even that's pretty low uh, for a well, you know, medium sized mammal. Uh, but if we just kind of take that as our, as our minimum, I'll show you a map. And then the, for breeding specifically, uh, you, you, you do need some period, some area that's, that's relatively private for at least, you know, the April up till maybe the beginning of June where the uh, pups who are not big enough yet to follow their parents can, can be in a den without being disturbed every single day by people. So there, there needs to be some small area and, and it's best I can guess it's somewhere, you know, 15 to 20 acres that people just don't really, don't, don't go, maybe once or twice, but really don't disturb the den. And so that's another requirement that we don't see perhaps in a place like Central Park, for example. So we take those requirements, at least the first one, the, the area requirement and map it over the region. Um, you can see uh, our threshold value of like, you know, 0.7 kilometers is somewhere in this orange. So any, so you can basically say anywhere that's orange or better, orange or yellow or green uh, could potentially be a place where a coyote sets up a den. So you can see it's like really, once you get out of the city, which has a lot of red, but you do have these blobs where coyotes you know might have a chance long island and especially suffolk gets pretty uh habitable for coyotes and so uh, and it resembles all the other places that coyotes have have flourished you know westchester and then of course when you get into the really urban areas of westchester it gets a little more restrictive and just the same thing with the urban parts of nassau it gets a little more restrictive but you still have places you know almost everywhere where they could probably do it um, so that's our sort of our prediction map of where we might find them. And as everything gets green, it becomes even more important to have people's eyes out there for us because I can't put cameras all through here. If I'm looking here, maybe I can go, okay, there, 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 there. I'll put cameras there and that's my best guess. Uh, but if I'm looking out here, <laughs> who knows where I should put cameras or, or look for SCAD and that sort of thing. So this is where, you know, uh, volunteer sightings uh, just from the residents is, is very useful. So far, we've collected many, many sightings. Not all of these have been confirmed. By confirmed, we mean you know maybe one of our group goes out and puts a camera up and we get a definitive picture of a coyote or we collect scat that's then genetically uh, confirmed to be coyote. Um, some of them have, but not all of them. But generally, this gives you an idea that like more and more sightings are happening uh, now and, and that uh, goes along with everything else we've observed. So what does this mean for people living in Long Island that are gonna have these guys uh, possibly in their backyard in the near future? Um, the main thing is, and I'm sure all of the people that will attend a workshop on, you know, on, on local wildlife have probably heard this stuff, right? That we're, we've got a sort of a self-selected audience today, I, I imagine. But uh, first off, you don't want these, and these are, like I said, very intelligent uh, creatures. They will, they will connect they will make that pattern recognition, you know, it'll happen really fast that they, you know, get a few free meals of someone, you know, who left dog food out for their, for their own pet and, and, you know, just left it out or, or, or someone, you know, on a golf course threw them a sandwich. They will, 
they will read that pattern and try it again and experiment. And so you don't ever want to feed them directly or even indirectly. Now that said, you know, there are not many coyotes on Long Island yet. Um, so, you know, really all of this stuff applies to things like raccoons and foxes and, and skunks and all the other wildlife you sort of have been dealing with already. So it's just the same kind of rules. Um, and, and the same thing with pets, you know, the, the risk of coyotes, you know, directly harming people is really, really low. Um, it, it's not zero, but especially in the East Coast, really very, very few instances, except when rabies has been involved. Uh, even then it's still few, but that's really the only time it ever has really happened where you have an attack or something. But more so, and still very low, but more so is the danger to people's pets. That's, that, that does happen. Um, and so, you know, again, fence your yard. That's, that's true, again, even if you don't have coyotes on your landscape, you ought to not let your cats wander around. They're gonna get hit by a car. There's gonna be someone else's dogs or there's raccoons, skunks, foxes, so um, hawks. So you, you, know, you wanna be careful with your pets even if there weren't coyotes. Um, and if you are gonna fence, I've fenced my yard for years. I lived with coyotes all over my, you know, adjacent properties to me. And um, I use this plastic deer fencing. It's really great, it's not too expensive. You can fence a large area. Um, and then, you know, people will uh, say, well, coyote can dig, you know, 10 feet underground and they can climb up 15 feet up a fence. And, you know, that's true but they're only gonna do that if there's a reason they wanna get in here. It's a big risk, it's a big expenditure of energy to climb over a fence like that. So there's gotta be something over here they want. And so what I recommend is, you know, do, do the basics. If you, you know, even now there's very few coyotes. So um, on Long Island, so you still got some time. But if you do decide to let your pets out and you do wanna install a fence, um, you can continue doing, you can do that and you can continue with your bird feeders and your compost piles and then observe your property. If you notice something, if you notice a coyote checking it out or they're starting to dig something, well, then you might want to observe, uh, address the attractant that's, that's maybe pulling them there. Like I said, a coyote is not going to want to do this unless there's a reason. Um, so if you fix that attractant, there's probably no reason to bother and then a, a simple fence would be adequate and i will say like if you have a cat that's out in your yard you're going to need a fence that's like this six or seven feet tall because they can climb over almost anything so that's my spiel about fencing is you don't have to go the full nine until you actually might really need it and the only people that would really need it is people maybe that have chickens or some sort of livestock where there's an obvious attractant and that attractant you know by nature you want to keep it and then the last thing i'll, I'll speak about is uh sort of community management plans where uh, this is very common out west with bears and coyotes and other wildlife. And it's basically some kind of rubric where, you know, some behavior is, is observed and then there's a, an, a response and it's a great gradiated, is granulated, gradiated response from, you know, rather non-threatening, non-problematic behaviors, um, you know, coyotes observed. And then maybe, so people may be concerned, so you do some education and you teach people maybe how to haze. If they don't want the coyote in their backyard, you know, bang some pots, spray it with the hose and, and, and that's enough. And then if God forbid you get these more uh, concerning behaviors, there's greater and greater response up to and including lethally, re lethally removing the, the animal. Good thing about coyotes is, you know, a new coyote will come in and it's not the same one. And if it doesn't learn those, if it's not reinforced to go after pets or look for food in people's yards, then it could behave very differently than the previous one. Um, and then our last thing I'll say is, you know, broad scale removal is just not an option for on a town level or, or large property level. It's illegal. <laughs> Coyotes are a protected, you know, regulated game species in New York. So you can't just say, I don't like them, get rid of them. And you know, and you can get permits to remove problem animals, but you can't do just generally. We hate the species; get rid of it. Um, there's others. There's lots of models out there. So this is what I would um, encourage. Maybe if people are especially concerned or interested, um, you encourage your town to maybe come up with something like this, or even at the county level, where um, people know 
people can people can look at the coyote they may be seeing and and determine whether it's bad or not or what what actions have been democratically decided are appropriate you know and it even helps you know sometimes i get um i talk to like police officers who are like i don't know what to do and if someone's complaining about a coyote and i can see the coyote but it's not attacking anyone but it's just kind of hanging out like what do i do well this thing would tell you um and so a lot of times i get people very concerned about coyotes it's, it's a big issue big issue but a month later the coyotes you know they their pups are done they're not out during the day anymore and then the the motivation disappears and then next year they call me again and so i would encourage those of you who who or care about this issue or interested in it, whether concerned or excited um, to maybe, you know, move on this in, in your own local uh, government or homeowners association or whatever it might be. Uh, so that's it for me. And I'm happy to stick around to answer questions. Uh, we do a lot of research. So I gave you just a little taste so I can, I can elaborate if people wish, but that's, that's all I got. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, we're going to do some questions at the end during the dedicated Q&A period. So I'm sure we're going to get a lot of great questions. Uh, next up, we will have Mike Bottini. He's going to talk about the Long Island Coyote Study Group. So whenever you're ready, Mike, you can take it away. Okay. So um, hopefully my PowerPoint is still up there somewhere. Not yet. I don't see your video on either. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, I see you now. Yep, and share screen. I think you're on Zoom still. You might have to go to PowerPoint. Oh boy. Maybe hit exit. I, I thought it would be still up there. I didn't change it from, uh, okay. You might just have to hit exit. exit. There we go. There we go. So you just hit the first slide. Okay, and uh, normal view. Here we go. Um, yeah. Okay. Here we are. Good. Can, you can see that. Yep. <laughs> it's always different every time I do this. <laughs> you got. <laughs> Okay, so this is a, a, a group that organized a couple of years ago, but we really, really just got going um, in 2020 uh, when we, we noticed that there were some definite uh, pairs of coyotes showing up. And um, it's, a, it's, it's a growing group. We, you know, it's a very informal group. You can see here we have a university or two and uh, the DEC, of course, uh, as the regulators for uh, all our conservation uh, fur bearers and other animals, wildlife. Um, the American Museum of Natural History, uh, they've offered to do some of the genetics work that uh, Chris mentioned. And we'll get into that a little bit later. And then uh, a couple of conservation groups you'll recognize. And even a uh, a uh, group of mountain lot, uh, climbers, um, mountain bike, my, mountain bikers, climb, uh, which some of you may know. Mike Vitti is the president, and uh, they've they've really done a terrific job contributing in terms of uh, sightings and and collecting scat. So our goals are basically to document the establishment of a breeding population of coyotes on Long Island and how that's going to change over time. Uh, monitoring the impacts of coyotes on our flora and fauna, which is you know, one of the more interesting ecological questions that we, we'd like to get info on. And, and even though this work has been done elsewhere in uh, North America, um, you know, every place is a little bit different. Uh, I, I learned this from doing river otter monitoring and learned that in, in uh, California, many of the um, researchers there are finding that the otters are really zeroing in on waterfowl and shorebirds, lar the large shorebird species. And uh, I don't see that at all here on Long Island, that strictly fish and crab eaters. And, uh, and also uh, otters are caching food, which uh, I've never seen here on Long Island. 
So it's always good to, uh, you know, replicate work that's done elsewhere in the geographic range and see if it uh, is similar or different and we can learn something from that. Then in, we've been doing a lot of training of volunteers to assist in the field work, both in how to set up uh, remote cameras that Chris talked about and monitor those cameras, and also to go out in the field and um, collect uh, coyote scat. So that involves trying to distinguish between other types of mammal scat found in the field. And last but not least, for sure, and this is probably uh, you know a really important priority right now is coyotes is starting to show up and starting to breed on Long Island, is educating Long Islanders on how to coexist with coyotes. And Chris got into a lot of that before. And here's um, Lisa Filippi from uh, Hofstra University. Uh, she has a, a couple of cameras out at a property in uh, Nassau County. So she checks these cameras and changes batteries and uh, SD cards and uh, has to go through it. You get a lot of images of different things and uh, generally not too many images of the target species, but uh, so going through these, is, it can be uh, time consuming, but uh, we spread the load, you know, we have a whole bunch of people doing this and we'll be recruiting more as the coyotes expand their range on Long Island. And then the scat surveys, now that being uh, the coyote is actually an omnivore and its diet changes seasonally, uh, but when it's eating, uh, when it's, when it's uh, eating meat, the generalization is that the scat has a lot of hair, maybe a little bit of bone, and it is um, pointed at both ends. And you know, with the with the ruler there, those are inches. So that's much larger than a typical red fox scat. There's a there's a lot of overlap between the two, um, but anything more than three quarters of an inch in diameter would 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 be uh, coyote. And so we send these scats to the American Museum of Natural History and they can uh, figure out what it has been eating and they can also get some DNA off of this to identify, first of all, to confirm whether or not it's a coyote and um, also get uh, the fingerprints. So then we can say, okay, are these related to the Bronx coyotes or, you know, a far-fetched hypothesis, but something that uh, I think is interesting to tech, uh, test. Is it possible that some coyotes are getting to Eastern Long Island by way of Fisher's Island, which has a breeding pair? And most of the young from Fisher's are gonna have to take to the water and disperse because it's so small, it's four square miles. And it, they have reached Martha's Vineyard, uh, which was a um, four mile swim. So it's, it's theoretically possible. And in the winter, we had a lot of fun this past winter, just trailing the coyote tracks and seeing how it moved through the landscape. We had about two weeks of snow cover. So um, that was really fun, fascinating. And uh, what, what areas, what, you know, we saw where they actually caught cottontail rabbit and some other things. So it was, it was really neat. And uh, I think Chris covered this pretty well, um, but you know, the basic rule of thumb is uh, we, we don't want coyotes to get habituated to humans. And um, that's it for me. Uh, and I, I'll turn it over to Ariel to talk about our coyote tracker survey. Awesome, thank you so much, Mike. If you wanna just end your screen share there, perfect. As Mike said, I'm going to talk to you all about SeaTuck's coyote tracker survey. So I'm going to just share my screen here. All right, can you all see the website okay? Yep. Awesome, thank you. So you're just going to navigate to SeaTuck's main website, which is seatuck.org, S-E-A-T-U-C-K.org. And this is the homepage that will pop up. 
you're going to go through the top navigation bar. There's about wildlife, education, events, and then you're going to stop at get involved. A drop down menu should show up. And if you go under community science projects, the second one down is the coyote tracker. Now we have the coyote tracker main page. And as you can see, the survey is embedded directly into the website. So if you ever forget how to get to the survey, you can always come back here and it'll always live here for you to visit. So I'm just gonna kind of take you through quickly what is included in the survey. Um, a little about section, um, the coyote tracker, which is managed by CTUC in cooperation with the Long Island Coyote Study Group, seeks to engage community science in tracking the migration and establishment of coyotes on Long Island. Early identification of adults and potential den locations will help scientists understand their colonization of Long Island. Has our coyote study group logo. And then it's pretty straightforward in the beginning, you know, full name, date, time, phone number, email address, all of the questions that have a red asterisk are required. So you won't be able to submit the survey unless you put information into these boxes. Then we have some coyote ID tips. Sometimes coyotes can look a lot like uh, German shepherds. So we have some tips to help you distinguish between the two, um, print ID tips, um, scat ID tips, so that's a really great resource to have. Questions like, have you seen a coyote on Long Island? And anytime you see an other option, you can type something else, anything that you'd like. But there's also predefined answers like yes, definitely, I'm pretty sure, and no. So where were you during your observation? This is a GeoPoint tool. So the question is going to ask you for your location. And our tip here is to please enable the location services on your mobile device. That way we can get the most accurate reading of your location. So this is probably gonna to wanna to try to find me and I think it did a pretty good job. So I'm gonna zoom out here. If you ever need to refine your location while you're out in the field, you just hit this crosshair, it says find my location. If you wanna go back to the home of where the extent of the map always stays, you just hit that home button. You can zoom in and zoom out with the plus or minus. You can search for addresses, use your current location that way. And then you could always drag and drop these little pins. You can even input lat and long into this box as well. The only thing I would note is that if you were at a park earlier and you may have seen a coyote, but now you're home, you're on Wi-Fi and you like to input that information, just make sure you're inputting the information where you had observed the coyote. So if it was at the park earlier that day, make sure that information goes in, not your home address. Other questions are, have you heard a coyote on Long Island? We have a link here to a YouTube video to show you what a typical coyote howl sounds like. How many coyotes did you see? What was the coyote doing? This is a short answer text, so you can just text, uh, type as much as you want in there. We have some more SCAT ID tips with details here. Den ID tips. And have you seen evidence of coyotes on Long Island? So since we're asking about dens and scats and tracks, we wanted to make sure you had all the resources you need to be able to correctly identify those, which is why we have those tips up there. Generally, what town were you in on the off chance that the GeoPoint tool just wasn't as accurate as we would hope? Um, this will kind of help us narrow it down and figure out where you were and who to contact. Please describe your surroundings. You can describe them up to a thousand characters. We have spots where you can include images. So these are for images that are saved on your phone. And then this little camera icon is for you to take live photos if you'd like. <clears throat> and then do you have questions for our biologists? So either Chris or Mike can answer any of the questions that you might have, whether it be about your submission or just general coyote questions. So like I said earlier, this will always be on CTUC's website, um, but there's also a different way that you can access 
this survey as well, and that is through the free Survey123 mobile app. So you can download the free app on your phone. And once you do that, we have instructions on the website telling you how to access all of this on your phone. There's a step-by-step -step process here, and then there's also a QR code. So since we're on my laptop right now, I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to access it from my phone and have it on your Survey123 app. So I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm gonna share my phone screen. Sorry, it just takes a second. Can you see my phone screen okay? Yep. Awesome. Okay, don't mind my black skimmer in the background there. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm going to open my camera. Then I'm not going to take a picture of the QR code. I'm just going to scan it and you can see that pop up at the top of my phone screen. So I'm going to hit that. And then I have two options. So I can either one, open this survey in my browser, similar to what I would be doing on my laptop, or I can open it in the Survey123 Fields app, which is that second option. And I've already downloaded the mobile app, so this will automatically open the page in Survey123, which is what it's asking right there. So I'm gonna hit open. And what's cool about this is that you actually don't need an ArcGIS sign-in. So you can just hit that third option on the bottom, continue without signing in. And then the survey pops right up and all the information is there, all the pictures are there, everything that you need is exactly the same. If you want to submit a survey, if you're out in the field at a later time, maybe when you're connected to Wi-Fi, you can save a draft. You just hit the top left X, save it in drafts. And if you see that Coyote Tracker survey with the little orange bubble on top that says one, it's basically just saying you have a draft here, don't forget to submit me. And then once you're on Wi-Fi, it'll save all of your inputs and you just submit it just like that. And you can delete it if you wanna try a new one. And now you can see on my home screen, I have all of my community science projects in one place. So if you're a person who likes to participate in the Terrapin Watch or in the Long Island River Herring Survey, you're just, you participate in multiple projects. This is super convenient. This way you don't have to navigate to each separate page on our website. You have it all right here. All right. I think that's it for the survey. I know I went through that a little quickly, but you will have my contact information at the end if you have any questions or issues accessing the survey. Um, so at this point, I believe we are all set for the Q&A period. Um, thank you all so much for tuning in and staying here with us. We're gonna just check out if there's any questions in the chat or the Q&A. I there see is. one. Oh. Yeah, there's one in the chat. Sorry. Yeah. From Kelly. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess this can either be for Chris or Mike, whoever wants to hop in. Are coyotes at all filling the niche left behind by the wolves we extirpated? I, um. I can say something on that to to a degree, yes, but most of if you're talking about things like uh, regulating deer numbers and things like that, uh, most most studies have found not really is the answer. They definitely take some amount of deer. That's that's one of the things we're interested in upstate and Westchester in particular, um, but not to the degree say if you had wolves, um, and so it, it's. It happens, they absolutely do it now and then, but whether it's some sort of thing that would have some top-down regulation on prey, 
um, is the answer is generally not really. I would add that uh, the, a big difference between the coyote, even the eastern coyote, and the wolf is the wolf is strictly a meat eater. And the smallest prey that's a significant part of its diet is the beaver, and the beaver is a pretty big animal. It's, it weighs as much as a coyote. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, and, the, and I, you know, when we talked about this, you know, I showed some pi a picture of this coyote scat. I mean, a lot of the scat we collect at certain times of the year. It's just all fruits and berries. So they, uh, yeah, they, they're very omnivorous, actually, um, during the late summer and early fall. Great, thank you. I have another question here. Why would lethal removal of coyotes be used instead of relocation? Yeah, relocation. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Mike, if you'd like. Uh, well, I, it, you know, when, when the coyotes are very territorial, so, um, you know, unless it's a dispersing individual that becomes a problem, it's going to be tricky to relocate it. And this is not just large mammals. I mean, even the, my spotted turtle study, you know, we have spotted turtles, box turtles, when they get a certain age, they have a homing instinct and uh, they'll travel whatever it takes to get back to their home turf. Yeah, generally animals never do well with relocation. There's a few that it works a little bit, but coyotes the few times people have put collars on a coyote before it was relocated due to some, you know, uh, management decision, you know, they nearly, it's basically a death sentence. And so they're either going to, you know, uh, conflict with the coyotes that are there in the place that they're pushed because they're generally everywhere um, or they're, you know, they'll, they'll conflict and either they will uh, be killed or chased out and then cause, you know, uh, more problems or cause it to die by the residents, or they'll disrupt the residents, you know, and so you're causing another problem. In addition, you know, legally, you're, you're not allowed to just remove wildlife, at least in, uh, anything but, you know, a pest species like a rat or something, but you aren't allowed to remove wildlife uh, just because you don't like it. It's got to be a legitimate um, problem right and so then if you were to relocate that animal you're just bringing the problem to someone else's neighborhood and so that's that's kind of the legal framework of that like you can't you can't remove wildlife unless they're a problem and if they're a problem you certainly can't put them somewhere else it gets a little more complicated in the city and really urban environments because you know if a coyote is found in battery park right is does that coyote want to be there did it get lost <laughs> Maybe you should move it. And it's not actually causing a problem, right? It's not attacking anyone. It's just running around uh, trying to hide. Um, so it does get a little more complicated and, and there probably would need to be um, some more, you know, just different regulations for a place like Manhattan versus where most of the game laws and regulations and policies, they're, they're made for upstate, right? Where you can haze a coyote and then it'll run into the woods. If you haze a coyote in Battery Park, it's gonna to run to the West Side Highway and that's not good either. So there's definitely a unique situation going on in New York City, but for the suburbs and the exurbs, um, relocation is not very, doesn't work very well. And then for all those reasons I said, it's it's not usually legal. So you, so if, if a wildlife control <clears throat> company tells you they can relocate coyotes for you or any other animal they're either doing it and it's illegal which they do all the time for raccoons which is causes all sorts of problems or they're not telling you the truth and they are killing it <clears throat> those are all good points yeah there there is a question here in the q a about so it says there's a season for hunting of coyotes in new york state would this be allowed on Long Island as well? That's of the DC right now. You can't hunt coyotes in region one, unless I'm mistaken, Mike. There's no hunting season in region one. Well, yeah, that's uh, 
there's there's a hunting season but it varies for coyote species yeah right so they haven't you know obviously the hunting regulations hunting and trapping regulations are supposed to reflect the resource in that wildlife management area so for the uh, region one which is nassau and suffolk county um, they can't justify having a coyote season because uh, we, like we 10 just coyotes. recently documented as in 2021 yeah. successful breeding um and i'm glad someone brought that up because uh we're hoping to launch a mammal survey of some other fur bearers on Long Island next year. And there's really, uh, in contradiction to that uh, way you're supposed to develop hunting and trapping regulations, we have some species on Long Island that are very rare, and yet they are allowed to be trapped. Uh, the long tail weasel, mink, and um, the gray fox. The gray fox we thought was extirpated from Long Island and they really can't justify a trapping season for that. And we're hoping to lobby uh, the DEC to change that at some point soon. Awesome, thank you. We have one more uh, question here. This is a good question for Chris. Uh, <laughs> is there a good I, I've, uh, you know, I, I, in my, I'm, I'm new to coyotes, basically. Chris has been doing this a lot longer than I have. So it's a new, a new study animal for me. And <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I don't think there's a really good basic resource. Uh, the information is scattered around the literature. And the other issue that we just talked about before we started this, um, Zoom meeting, uh, I was asking Chris about the idea of uh, doing an annotated bibliography specifically on uh, research done on the Eastern Coyote, which is a little bit different than the Western Coyote in some ways. But yeah, Chris. Um, if you're interested in like the urban coyote question, um, I would definitely look up I think the website's urbancoyoteresearch.org, but it's it's Stanley Garrett's lab at I think Ohio State, but they have run the largest uh, urban coyote study. But there's also National Park Service research going on in LA. Um, there's some there's a book by um, Jonathan Way who worked in Massachusetts. So there's lots of people looking at urban coyotes um, and have written their books. I recently got a book called Coyote America. Uh, which which kind of runs the whole gamut from history, social, you know, human coyote relations, <laughs> and PR, and then to some biology. So there are some places, but it it's very you know the interesting thing about this situation specifically is we're seeing all these changes happen in real time, you know, so that so the the common knowledge about coyotes changes all the time because. You know, oh look, a coyote can live in Central Park for two years. Nobody really thought that would happen. <laughs> uh, so uh, it is a little bit hard, but it's really interesting because it's changing, and we're learning new things right now. You can certainly follow Gotham Coyote Project on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll put all the links in the email and in the chat too. Um, I have another question here. Are coyotes the only mammal wildlife encountered by the residents of Long Island that could potentially be harmful? And are there any other monitoring programs for them? He said, for example, maybe like wolves, big cats, foxes, et cetera. Um, you know, the interesting thing, like if you look at the numbers, you know, deer are far more dangerous than coyotes just from vehicle collisions and, and uh, you know, deer don't really attack people. But in terms of actual danger, of actual risk versus your perceived risk of the big bad wolf, uh, the deer are far more dangerous. You've got, and so if you go down that route, you've got deer ticks, <laughs> and you've got uh, dogs. Dogs are more dangerous than coyotes. Um, you know, champagne bottles are more dangerous than coyotes statistically. Um, so uh, there aren't really any large predatory, you know, 
tooth and claw animals. Um, Mike may know, I mean, no one really gets hurt by foxes. Um, so coyotes would be like the biggest carnivore that, that you'll have on Long Island. Maybe one day the bears and the bobcats will come back. Yeah, I think that's really interesting to point out something you said, the perceived danger, I think, sometimes wins, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, the, the fun fact I throw, and I, I, I don't want it to be interpreted in, the, in reverse, but, you know, you're more likely to get, get hurt if you have a dog in your house versus a coyote in your backyard. Mm. Um, and again, I don't want people to now be afraid of dogs. Right. <laughs> it's, to, it's to do the opposite. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, totally get that. Um, we have, let's see, I think we have a minute left for this one last question here. It says, could coyotes help lower the rat population on Long Island? <laughs> exactly, That's what, I didn't want that to happen. <laughs> Be prudent about champagne bottles. Yes, now Andrea is <laughs> afraid of champagne bottles. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> so, does anyone want to attack oh, I didn't the, see. the rat question? <laughs> well, it, you know, it, as, as we were saying, you know, it, it's such a generalist that it's, and one of the reasons why it's so successful, um, you know, we, we've declared war on a number of these large carnivores over the last like 200 years. And we, we, we decimated the wolves and the mountain lions in a lot of areas, bobcats also. Um, but coyote has uh, been just uh, too, too smart for us. And, um, and it's also something about the way it reproduces it's stimulated to have larger litters the more you poison and shoot them and trap them. So while we declared war, and including having a federal agency in charge of eliminating the coyotes out west, uh, they've expanded their range all across North America. I mean, it's pretty phenomenal. So one of the reasons why is that it, it is a very, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a generalist ecologically, and it, it's very efficient in terms of its hunting. And it just goes for the easiest prey available. So if there's a lot of rats around, it'll zero in on the rats. Um, and in terms of the deer, uh, we thought that they were, deer is an important part of their diet in the winter and the spring in a lot of areas of the Northeast. But when, when the researchers put radio collars on the coyotes that were heavily feeding on deer, what they found was, like 90 percent, I think that it was 90 something percent of the deer that they fed on were road kills. And uh, they, so they, they're scavengers. Hey, why, why am I going to try and run down a deer in the middle of the winter in the snow uh, and use all that energy when I've got all of these road killed deer <laughs> just laying there? Uh, they do actually go after fawns for a brief period of time in the early summer. So there's a period of time when the fawns can't outrun a coyote. And they, in some cases, they, uh, they do uh, make an impact on the fawn survival rates. But even in those situations, they, they haven't been shown to reduce the overall deer population. So they're kind of replacing natural mortality at the f early fawn stage with uh, predatory behavior. Gotcha. So we, we would need a lot of coyotes for <laughs> well, you know, well, they, well, you know, like I said before, every place is a little bit different. And the east end of Long Island has an incredible uh, deer population. And we also have a little bit of a different structure in our environment in the form of a lot of deer fences. And I can see the coyote figuring out how to corner deer up against these uh, fences and actually been able to take them down. But normally a coyote uh, is not going to outrun a healthy deer. And we don't have the, the severe winters that give them a little bit of a, 
a leg up on on uh, catching a deer in deep snow. Gotcha. So it looks like that's all the questions, right, Jimena? I think we went through all of them. Um, I think I think that's right. Um, oh, there was another question that was, are there any other monitoring programs for coyotes on Long Island or maybe looking for wolves, big cats, foxes, et cetera? It would, oh, there's no wolves or big cats, uh, mountain lions down here, maybe someday. <laughs> um, but I think Mike is interested in foxes as well. Yeah. Um, I do have a, a iNaturalist project that I check maybe once a year, but I definitely still keep my eye on it. That was supposed that was trying to map coyotes and fox, but I've sort of stopped doing it since we have this other one now, and I don't want to, <laughs> you know, keep um, have people go to two different places. But maybe we can talk about putting fox or gray fox on on. Yeah, depends so on. You so the, uh, the DEC is training, is, is offering workshops for natural resource staff throughout the state. Uh, got kind of messed up with COVID, but they're, they're training um, folks to do small mammal surveys. And I'm um, hoping to do one of those workshops and bring it down to Long Island. Matter of fact, on Friday, I'm talking to Polly Wiegand at the, uh, the Ecologist for the Central Pine Barrens Commission about uh, getting involved with that. And, um, but as part of that, we also want to launch a uh, mammal um, camera trapping uh, project, which uh, we could involve a lot of volunteers. They just not need to know how to set up a camera trap and monitor it. And there's so many people who have these camera traps now, um, or remote, remote trail cameras that uh, we could really get some great information on some species whose distribution we have no idea about. Longtail weasel, mink, some of the ones I mentioned before, skunk and um, gray fox, um, be great. Yeah, that would be super interesting to put together and see. So that, that's on the list for 2022. And we'll probably make an announcement at the uh, Long Island Natural History Conference next March about that. Awesome. I think we just have one quick last question and then we can wrap it up. Someone asks if there's coyotes at Jones Beach. Uh, that we had a... Uh, uh, let's see. No, not, not Jones Beach or Robert Moses. Yeah. Robert Moses State Park, which is the next barrier island to the east. And we have um, a, a guy that's with the Fire Island National Seashore Park Service. Uh, do you remember his name? Uh, he's been he's been tracking them. He's got uh, some trail cameras set up. And uh, whoa, what's going on there? <laughs> okay. And. <laughs> it seems at this point, it seems like a single coyote and he's already, uh, because he found out about this animal out there um, last winter when we had some snow cover, and he's already got some really interesting information on what it's doing out there. It, it appears that it has uh, taken down uh, some deer and Fire Island is another one of those special cases where uh, in the in the recent past, when we've had a severe winter, the, the deer are so borderline going into the winter in terms of their uh, fat stores that th there have been mass die-offs. Uh, I went through the wilderness area about 15 years ago, and it was like a graveyard of deer. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, the same person said that they saw a fox at Robert Moses last year. Yeah, actually, what's what's really cool about uh, Fire Island is we have several years of data from a group from Virginia Tech who did a red fox study. So they were doing uh, diet analyses, and they actually had some radio collared foxes that they tracked. So it'll be interesting to be able to 
compare the red fox movements and behavior and population pre-coyote and post-coyote on Fire Island. The yeah, fast definitely. That'd be really interesting. So it looks like it's 309. So to respect everyone's time, we'll just go ahead and wrap up the webinar for today. I just want to take a moment to thank our panelists, Chris, Mike, thank you so much for sharing your time and your knowledge thank with you. us. Thank you, Jimena, my co-host and the co-creator of Community Science LI for helping me moderate today and keeping track of all those great questions we received. And finally, thank you all for joining us to learn more about coyotes on Long Island, how we can monitor them and how that information we gather as volunteer community scientists help researchers better understand these fascinating creatures. I did just, <clears throat> excuse me, I did just wanna give a quick plug for the brand new Wildlife Monitoring Network website, CTUC and our partners at the Peconic Estuary Partner, uh, Partnership developed a website that acts as a one-stop shop for community science opportunities on Long Island. So it's really cool. Um, Jimena will put that link into the chat. And if you or someone you know is interested in learning about all the different opportunities that are out there from some really great organizations, we really encourage you to visit that website. If you have any questions about that or anything that we discussed today, please feel free to reach out. I know Jimena also put our contact information in the chat as well, but there will be a follow-up email with that contact information as well. All of the links to the resources we shared today, including a link to the recording that will be up shortly after we conclude. So again, thank you all. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day.